Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, the last time, Q Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, the last time there was a dinner date between Mr. Juncker and Prime Minister May. It was in London. He came to visit her, and it all ended in disaster when it was leaked within hours of the dinner finishing that Mr. Juncker thought the British Prime Minister was deluded if she thought she was going to get a proper trade deal out of the European Union without coughing up a vast amount of money. Well, this time, it's different. This time, Mrs May has gone to Mr Juncker's. And there'll be other friends there. Mr Barnier will be in the room, and Mr Davis will be in the room, and Mr Selmayr, who's the guy that works for Juncker, that we think leaked it all last time, and a new name that you won't have heard of, Ollie Robbins, who's from the Department of Exiting the European Union, uh, who is seen to be a very senior uh, civil service figure. Uh, joining me now is LBC's political editor, Theo Usherwood. Theo, is this meeting, uh, is this dinner out of the blue, or, or, or had you heard about it last week? Very good question. Uh, good evening, uh, good Nigel. Evening. It was out of the blue. Now, Number 10's insisted this morning, absolutely insisted, that this was a meeting uh, which had uh, they'd planned back at the time of the Florence speech at the end of last month when uh, Theresa May said there would be a, a the, in effect, we wouldn't leave the European Union until at the end of a transitional uh, deal, which went down very well. But the truth is that if you look at the slot, it's a 6.30 in Brussels start time. That is not when uh, European bigwigs like to do their business. It's a little bit later in the evening. That's when you get the oysters and caviar and all the trimmings. <laughs> you know that too. Well. I've, I've worked there for many years. Yeah, I know. <laughs> as I said, as I've said earlier, this is the spaghetti hoops with a three-year-old slot. It's not the prime time. <laughs> uh, and that's what uh, and that's what this is all about, because, of course, it's been rushed in. Theresa May's managed to get 90 minutes uh, with uh, Jean-Claude Juncker. Michel Barnier will be there. Ollie yep. Robbins, who actually is now transferred over to the Cabinet Office. He had a bit of a falling out with uh, David Davis, we suspect, and is now actually working directly for Theresa May in the Cabinet Office and is, of course, the main uh, chief negotiator in the room. The interesting character, I think, in all of this is Martin Sommer. Chief of Staff to Jean-Claude Juncker, because yep. the last time he was in a meeting with uh, Mr Juncker and Mrs May, it was back in Downing Street before the election, Mr Juncker comes over, they sit down, Theresa May thinks it's gone very well. A few hours later, the, the entire contents of the meeting finds itself in the European press, the idea that Mr Juncker had gone into that meeting feeling relatively positive, come out and was ten times more sceptical than he was when he'd went in. Uh, Mrs May had even brought up the fact that she wanted to discuss other things. Mr Juncker then says rather witheringly, what like? Uh, and the fact is, all of this found itself in the European press. Can yeah. see we all think of Mr Sommer? Well, well I can tell you, Theo, details. I can tell you, Theo, that the week after that story broke out, I spoke to Juncker face to face in the European Parliament before one of our friendly monthly chit chats that we have there. Um, and I was teasing him and he said it was all a disaster. So Juncker was saying to me he didn't leak it, which obviously means it must have been this Selmayr character. But tell me something. If the Prime Minister now is getting directly involved, going to meet Juncker and Barnier, and if, as I understand it, she's made telephone calls to Macron from France and Merkel from Germany, it seems that she's now taking a little bit of a leading role in all of this to try and break the stalemate. Where does that leave David Davis? Out in the cold. Out in the cold. But we knew, we knew there was a tension with Mr Davis uh, from, the fact, from the time when it was last month when uh, Ollie Robbins was transferred across. He was the permanent secretary of the Department for Exiting yep. the European Union. And it's a little bit like, uh, and I'm sure you've, well I was going to say, you, you know the experience, but you've probably done it as the boss. When you don't quite trust your employee to be there, so you go in yourself and you, and you man-manage it, you man-manage the situation, Nigel. And that uh, is arguably what has happened to Mr Davis now, is Theresa May has come in to take charge of this situation. And the reason for that is very crucial, in that this was, we were supposed to be moving on to phase two of the negotiations, i.e. A, a, a trade deal, talking about a trade deal with the European Union yep, yep. this month. 
That's now, in effect, been bounced on to December. And the calculation that's been made in Brussels, and you'll know this too well, is if you squeeze that time period, because, of course, everything is meant to be done and dusted within the next 12 months, by October next year, if you squeeze that time period, it puts the pressure on, and it makes it even more likely that Britain is going to find it very, very difficult to get any sort of meaningful trade deal, which isn't a punishment Brexit, uh, by the end of this uh, Article so 50 period. And that's why Theresa May needs to try and crack this deadlock now, or if she's not going to crack it now, she needs to crack it by December. So she's asking, I guess, to move on to phase two, but she's also, in a sense, is she not, begging for us to have this transition period? Absolutely. Um, that seems to have gone down, from my understanding, the idea of the transition period which she talked about in Florence, has actually yep. gone down, and that's relatively feasible. The issue is around this European Court of Justice and what it means for EU, the three million EU nationals who live in the UK. Now, of course, what you could end up is a situation, because Brussels is insisting that they should be subject to European law, yeah, where yeah. you have a two-tier system, where actually EU nationals have more rights in Britain than British people, uh, British citizens which have just, in Britain. Which uh, is politically uh, impossible, isn't politically it? Impossible. And, yeah. and, and, and for the for the Tory Eurosceptics, for those likes of Bill Cash, for your Bernard Jenkins, for your uh, Peter Bones, it is ideologically untenable that you could have the rule of uh, yeah. the European Court of Justice oh, yeah. presiding over the U European yeah, over no, the UK. Theo, thank you. And as and when the gossip comes out and the leaks occur, please come straight back onto us. Thanks. Thank you. That was Theo Usherwood uh, talking about the circumstances of this rather extraordinary dinner uh, that is probably just winding up now in Brussels as we speak. So I've been saying for a long time I thought the Prime Minister had to get a grip. I've said for a long time too that I felt this summit that is coming up on Thursday and Friday morning of this week when the 28 Prime Ministers and Presidents from across the European Union meet is a very important moment. Um, I'm asking you, is Mrs May calling these leaders, turning up for dinner with Juncker and Barnier, is this a sign that she's now getting a firmer grip on negotiations? Is that a good thing or is it a sign of desperation? And that's really the question I'm going to ask you. I despite the fact I've wanted her to get a grip, um, I think she's possibly left it a bit too long. Uh, my own feeling is that if she doesn't come home on Friday, having, to some extent, uh, got rid of this image that we've had since Florence, that she's prepared to appease the European Union, then I think, by the weekend, we'll start to hear talk of a challenge to her position from somebody inside Conservative ranks. Let me know what you think. Call me. Maybe you think, finally, some leadership. Call me on 0345 6060 973. If you think it all looks a bit desperate, text to 84850. Or perhaps you think this is the nail in the coffin of Brexit, and we look very weak indeed, in which case you can tweet on at LBC using the hashtag Farage at LBC, and you can watch me and comment on Facebook. I'm live here in Los Angeles, and we have our first caller this evening. It's Ellis from Manchester. Good evening, Ellis. Good evening, Nigel. How are you? I'm well. So does this look like the firm authority of a prime minister getting a grip of the negotiations to you? I mean, for, for me, um, I, I think it is a show of force. Um, to be honest with you, I think now that we've seen this kind of this kind of namby pambying um, with the European Union, uh, I mean David Davis for me has been extremely strong. I'm, I'm a quite um, firm Conservative voter, um, and I must admit I, I I'm one of the people who thinks that Theresa May's time has now come. Um, however, I think that it is very important that she shows some force in these negotiations now and reinforces the message to um, Barnier and to Mr Juncker that we are prepared more than anything to take a no deal um, and that we will not settle for a deal that is, that is not just bad but completely wrong for the British people. If she did that, Ellis, if she comes back on Friday and says, look, I've told these guys, enough's enough. We've conceded and conceded. We did it in a spirit of goodwill. We've had nothing back. I've laid it on the table. Uh, you know, unless they come up with something in six months, we're off. Would that then change your mind about her premiership? 
Um, no, for me, unfortunately, as a Conservative voter, her premiership needs to come to an end. Um, and that's mainly for the reason that she called the election this year um, and was wholly responsible for the okay. almost defeating it. But back to the point that you're making, um, I think we are almost forgetting that the European Union need us as much as we need them, OK? So the idea that a mutually beneficial trade deal is in the best interest of both parties, is correct. So to, why would the European Union spite their own face? Um, but there we go. Uh, that, that. Ellis, Ellis, logic, your economic logic is absolutely flawless. However, you're dealing here with fanatics who want to build the United States of Europe and don't care who gets hurt or who gets in the way. Ellis, I thank you very much indeed for your call. Mary says on Facebook, definitely not a sign of desperation. Go for it, Mrs May. Um, David, on the other hand, by text says, for Hofstadt, Barnier and Juncker are playing games with a weak and feeble PM. Well, she's got a chance, I suppose, between now and Friday morning to show that she's not weak and Feeble. John in Bournemouth, what do you think? Is she doing the right thing? Well, let's just get there. Firstly, greetings to you in LA and my friends in California. I'm pleased to hear that the fires near Orville have gone out. Yes, they've had a horrible yeah. time. Yeah. They've, yeah, had they've had an absolutely horrible time. time. Yeah, yeah. and actually, firstly, it's the first time I've spoken to you since the day the um, Labour manifesto came out. I was interested, actually, on a couple of hours ago on your Facebook, you posted a thing from Michael Heaver saying the British government needs to prepare itself for a hard Brexit. I yeah. don't think they do, Nigel. I think we have to actually just fall back to what we vote. What, well, I didn't. I actually voted in primary school uh, in 1973 for the EU. I was about an eight-year-old, because in Cornwall they're going about fisheries, and I said, no, we have to go back to that. We voted for a trade association. Sure, but that, that was then. Simple. That that was then, John. This yeah, is but now. but that's our fallback position, because John Major, despite all his cone helplines, you know, his Tories are like, Nigel, <laughs> Cone's helpline was democracy, <laughs> but he signed the Maastricht <laughs> Treaty. We didn't get a vote, and look what happened. I know, I he know, I know. Over there to sort of negotiate but if, this for us. I, I'm but sorry, John, but I'm, John, but John, if yeah, they I'm, won't, if they won't, I mean, let's hope they do. Yeah. But if they, being Juncker, Barney, Verhofstadt, and yeah, the yeah. European Parliament, don't forget them in all of no. this, because they, they have and their own veto. And the and everything else, yeah. You know, if, they, if they're not prepared to be reasonable and logical with Mrs May, does a point come this week or very soon when she says, do you know, do you know what, guys, we're off? The problem is, Nigel, Santa Claus is going to come down my chimney. And the moment Santa Claus comes down my chimney, Mrs May is finished. Okay. As I put a while ago. And I think okay. Santa's coming down my chimney a bit earlier this year. You but may well be right, that. John. You, John, I, I agree with you. I think unless she really, really gets a grip this week, I think she'll be gone before too long. John, I thank you very much for your call. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, live from Los Angeles. It's 11.15 here and 7.15 in the UK. Nick Ferrari at breakfast on LBC. The idea that NHS doctors and nurses in England will be required to ask every patient from the age of 16 to declare their sexual orientation. To Peter Sunyard is chairman of the Family Doctors Association. It isn't the first thing I want to be asking in a consultation. Now you can imagine the situation. Where's your bunions, is it? And by the way, are you gay, straight, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender? Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Every weekday morning from 7. Only on LBC. With Hampton by Hilton. Now open in Aberdeen. As part of history's World War II season, meet our new ally. Hi, it's Suns. Digging for unknown stories. This is World War II, so we're thinking big. We dug up a tank in Dorking. And out of a bomber over Duxford, we found... A Lucy. Well, what did you think? An unexploded bomb? No, we found that in Liverpool. World War II Treasure Hunters, a brand new series tonight at nine on History. Selco Builders Warehouse proudly presents Selco's Deal of the Week. We got it at Selco. Selco, it's where the trade goes. Get down to your nearest Selco this week and get a 450 by 550 millimeter Fentro Skylight window for only 69.99 XBAT. But hurry, this offer ends 22nd of October. Find your nearest branch at selcobw.com. We got it at Selco. Selco, it's where the trade goes. <laughs> Darling, what's wrong? I missed a call. It was that big order. And when I called back, he'd already gone with another supplier. <laughs> Why? Why didn't we have e-receptionist answering and directing our calls? 
Avoid the horror of the missed call from just 30p a day with e-receptionist. Visit ereceptionist.co.uk for your free 30-day trial. <laughs> free trial must be cancelled within 30 days to avoid fees. You know your 70s. From your 80s. From your 90s. From your noughties. Let's go, It's a... But do you know your pension options? PensionWise is a service set up by the government to provide free, impartial guidance about your pension pot. If you're over 50, call 0800 138 1888 to book your free telephone or face-to-face -face appointment. PensionWise. Get to know your options. Upgrades are everywhere. Upgrade your phone, upgrade your wardrobe, upgrade your TV package. But will these upgrades move essential building kit across the country? It's van month this October at Renault, so why not take advantage of the best kind of upgrade for your business? And with the Renault Scrappage Scheme, you can swap old for new and save thousands towards the purchase of a selected new Renault panel van, including on our brand new Formula Edition range. Order by 31st December and register by 31st January 2018. Participating dealers only, business customers only. Visit your nearest Renault Pro Plus dealership to find out more. For full eligibility criteria and terms, go to renault.co.uk slash van hyphen scrappage. I love iPhone. When I get a new one, I can't stop finding new amazing things it can do. But suddenly, bam, all my data's gone and the rest of the month is, well, empty. Please, can you help? Certainly. At Vodafone, the iPhone 8 comes with an extra 10 gig on us, so you can love it even more. It's available now in-store and online with a 24-month extended warranty at no extra cost. You won't find that on any other network. The future is exciting. Ready? Vodafone. Credit check and minimum term agreement apply. Extra data on selected red plans only. Purchased by 31st October. See vodafone.co.uk forward slash terms. This is LBC, The Nigel Farage Show. Call 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage on LBC. Mrs May tries to get a grip on the Brexit process. David Davis appears to be pushed to the sidelines and they've just finished a dinner in Brussels with Juncker and Barnier. Andrew asks me on Facebook, who's paying for all this caviar and champagne? Well, Theo Usherwood, LBC's political editor, made the point earlier that tonight is not a caviar and champagne dinner. It's more like spaghetti hoops. I don't really believe that, but there we are. Um, now, Philip is calling me from Limington in Hampshire. He's a new caller to the show. Philip, she's doing something at last, isn't she? Well, well, she is, Nigel. Philip Morris from uh, Hampshire. Can I say to you firstly, before I say anything else, thank you, Nigel, for doing all you can to give me back my sovereignty in my 60s when it was taken away from me in my 20s. So a that's, huge thank you to you. That, well, that's kind of you, but is Mrs May going to complete the job or are we going to finish up stuck in transition deals for well, years and years to come? Uh, Nigel, I'm not sure. i just make the point. I, I'd make two points on this concisely for you. Yep. Um, in my opinion, the very interesting wartime analogy, which I'm sure you're only too well aware of, in that T Theresa, to me, uh, reminds me of the uh, uh, the Chamberlain situation in which uh, Churchill uh, spoke out to put some spine into the uh, uh, wartime cabinet, which of course Boris is trying to do now. Like Churchill, Boris has made himself very unpopular, and of course uh -huh. we can see Hammond in the role of almost a Lord Halifax with uh, <laughs> in the middle of Chamberlain. I think you'll agree it's quite an interesting analogy. Well, no, it is quite interesting. No, it is quite <laughs> interesting, Philip. I like it. Um, and, and I'm going to be concise for you, Nigel, because. Uh, but the second point I'd make to answer your question is that I run negotiation skills courses for companies, and anybody, nice. as I, I know you do, uh, who has uh, the slightest knowledge on negotiation, understands that all issues are interlinked, and nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And I would say, how dare the EU try to sequence this in such a manner that we have to agree certain things before they will get round to talking about trade, because we have to be able to keep some cards up our sleeve and say, well, look, we will give you this, but then we have to consider what other issues, you know, that, uh, that uh, we are demanding, and that these issues have to be interlinked, Nigel, I would say. No, no, I agree with that, and in fact, uh, David Davis did say in the past, you know, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, but we are now completely at stalemate with, I know. Bar with, with Barnier, the chief negotiator, saying, you know, the Brits haven't jumped high enough for us, uh, we're not going to move on to the next phase. I mean, is that above all the thing that Mrs May needs to establish this week? Does she need to come back on Friday with at least the victory that we're discussing trade as well? Well, funny enough, I, I worked and, and met Mrs. May, because I was an activist in her constituency in Maidenhead. I got to know, and we argued about Europe quite a bit sometimes. But what I would say is that 
um, in, in a way, she, we've almost given away too much too soon, in my opinion. Um, I think she's got to be much tougher. And, of course, she has her own fifth columnist, as I refer to them, back yep. here at home. And when yep. you have the Labour Party saying, of course, well, we will have a deal, what they're really saying is, uh, is at any cost, which oh, completely undermines her negotiating position anyway. Quick question for you, Philip, as a Conservative supporter and activist. Do you think, as I do, that unless she comes back on Friday with some concrete progress, or at least has laid down some timelines to these people, that there could be a leadership contest coming soon? Uh, yes, I do. And I think, uh, if I may, I don't wish to be crude to you, but we have to put some spine into I'll use the word spine. We have to put some yep. spine into this, and I'm not at all sure that Theresa is the right person to do that. No, 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 I think you may well be right. Philip, I thank you very much for your call, for making your points. I'm going to ask Nick in Harlow. What do you think, Nick? Evening, Nigel. Thank Evening. you for your producers for putting me on. Um, uh, you're one of the more astute and intelligent politicians in the British arena at the moment, albeit that you're lurking in the US at the moment. <laughs> well, I'm not, I, no, I'm not lurking, Nick. Far from lurking. I'm, 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 I'm out and very public. I'm here, and I'm, I'm here, and I'm, I'm actually Good talking, man. Nick. I'm actually talking, Nick, to a lot of very disappointed American business people who really thought that Brexit was a fabulous opportunity for us to get closer, remove yeah. barriers to trade, and now and I feel their pain. Yes. I agree you with know. you. Anyway, um, Mrs. So anyway, is Mrs. May, Nick, is she doing the right thing? Yes, she is, because her soul, and this is something that I'm completely perplexed about, because neither you nor anyone else who I do respect within the British political establishment has mentioned this. Her job is not to do a massive leadership role. Her job is not to save the country. Her job is to be a circuit breaker. Her job is to take the country until Brexit and then retire gracefully. Um, exit stage left, you know, pursued uh -huh. by bears and wolves and whatnot, um, <laughs> and disappear off the stage. She's not supposed to be a, a Winston Churchill or a Margaret Thatcher. She's a circuit breaker. But Nick, needs to insula but Nick, my point to you would be this, that what the referendum did, it was an instruction to our leaders to turn the ship of state around by 180 degrees. And that to do something of that magnitude, you actually have to believe in it. And my concern is that everything she does with this is half-hearted. She couldn't even answer Ian Dale last week, who said, if there was a referendum now, how would you vote? Doesn't she need, doesn't she need more belief and passion to do this? No, she doesn't, I'm, I'm All right. afraid. All um, right. Uh, um, her job is to simply take us through, get us out the other side, and to drink that poison's chalice, because it is a poison chalice. Nigel, you wouldn't be in the seats, in the hot seats at this point, would you? Oh, good Lord, yes. If anybody had asked me... You would? To, if anybody had asked me to help with the Brexit process... Oh, then you're process, a brave man, sir. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and yeah, I agree with you. It's a very difficult job, but, I th I, Nick, I'm going to disagree with you. I don't think she's just a circuit breaker. I think to lead the country to this big, big change of direction, I think you need real leadership. But, Nick, if I'd been asked to do something, I would have done it, believe me. Uh, and thank you for your call. Nigel, my husband and I are up for a no deal. Deal. But how could this ever be achieved as it has to go through Parliament to be voted? And Remainer MPs would veto it, says Anne in Sussex. Anne, there is something bigger perhaps building behind the scenes here, and it's what John McDonnell, the Labour Shadow Chancellor, was hinting over the weekend. Namely, that Labour will do what they can in Parliament to try and stop a no deal, and I've no doubt... There are Anna Subris and Ken Clarks and perhaps even some inside the cabinet who might do that as well. So, so I mean, I'm personally, you know, getting very near the point where I think we're wasting our time. We just go. We accept the no deal. It's not the end of the world. We open ourselves up to the rest of the world. Uh, but Parliament could be a real problem on this. And it could be. It just could be, Anne, that all of this suits the European Union perfectly. It suits the European Parliament, it suits Juncker, it suits Barnier, because they think, by guaranteeing no deal, that they might see a Conservative government that was elected 
on a Brexit ticket brought down and a general election in which Mr Corbyn, who despite his previous history, now leads a party uh, that actually would concede and concede and concede. That, as a scenario, I promise you, is not impossible. Robert is my next caller from Upchurch in Kent. Robert, good evening. Does Mrs May look strong or weak in what she's doing this week? Good evening, Nigel. At evening. last, I've been able to speak to you. Well, has, um, it, has it taken you months to get through? Well, I've, I've been through, but unlucky enough to, uh, uh, unlucky uh, not to actually speak to you, but um, uh, great I'm speaking to you now. You're on um, now, so, so te you're, you're on LBC, Robert. Tell us what you think. OK, well, this, um, this meeting, this dinner, yeah. um, the, the way I see this, Nigel, is um, one of two things have happened here. They've either summoned um, Mrs May uh, to go and talk to them, or she's requested this. Now, if she's been summoned, um, she's there. Why? It's to smooth things over and to appease these people. You know, they've already proved that they're, they're playing hardball. And, well, you know, well, one, th one thing, thing, Robert... One thing, Robert, that shocked me was before the Florence speech, we learnt that she'd run her speech by John claude Juncker first, as if she'd gone to the headmaster to say, is it OK if I tell the class this? So I hope she's not been summoned, Robert. I don't think she's been summoned. I think this time she has taken a bit of an initiative, but how far she's prepared to take it, I'm really not sure. Yeah, so she's requested this meeting, this dinner, yeah. And if you request something there, straight away you're on the back foot. You know, you're on the back foot and you're listening to people and you're not, you're not going to get your views across. Now, I've been um, listening uh, to a chap called Ian King um, on another well-known um, yep. news switch. Yep. And he had yep. a, uh, a interview with a chap called Richard Tice. I now, know Richard, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I've been to, I haven't actually listened to him before, unfortunately. I wish I'd had. Yeah, um, but um, um, your young lady at the other end said no. He's been on there a couple of times. This oh man, yeah, this yeah. man needs to be. He has. He needs more airtime. This man is very, very. Well, good. I I can tell you, Robert, Richard Tice and I worked together in the referendum. He's a businessman who came into politics purely for the European issue, and it's people like him with knowledge, business, and passion, Robert, that should be part of our negotiating team. And yet. What does she have around her career politicians and civil servants? Robert, I thank you for the call. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, live from Los Angeles. It's 7.30 and time for the news with Philip Chrysikos. Three people have died while hundreds of thousands are without power this evening as the worst storm in history moves through the island of Ireland. It began in the Republic and is now tracking northeastwards through Northern Ireland with winds of more than 96 miles an hour. Theresa May is in Brussels dining with European Union negotiators as she tries to break the deadlock over Brexit. Among those with the Prime Minister is Michel Barnier and Jean-Claude Juncker and her Brexit secretary, David Davis. A paedophile scientist has pleaded guilty to 137 sex offences. 28-year-old Matthew Folder, who works at Birmingham University, admitted charges including blackmail, inciting the exploitation of a child and encouraging rape. He'll be sentenced in December. LBC weather, wet and windy in the north with strong winds moving from Northern Ireland into Northern England and Scotland. Scotland this evening and overnight. Dry elsewhere, a low of 13 degrees. Tomorrow, wet and windy in northern England, Scotland and Northern Ireland, but easing through the day. Dry elsewhere, a high of 16 degrees. LBC Travel and the North Circular is stop-start southbound. That's between Redbridge and the Barking Flyover. It's after a car broke down. Porters Avenue in Beckentree, that's queuing in both directions, just off Wood Lane, and it's because of a police investigation. Green Lane's in Haringey, that's looking slow on the northbound side towards an accident just before St Anne's Road. And the A12, it's queuing southbound between Hackney Wick and the Blackpool Tunnel, and it's after an accident. LBC Travel, I'm Anne-Marie Walsh. This is LBC. How did a military tank end up beneath a Surrey vineyard? And what will be left of a German bomber in a Liverpool marsh? Join Madness frontman Suggs and expert relic hunter Stephen Taylor as they dig up World War II treasures and work to uncover the fascinating tales buried with them. World War II treasure hunters, 9pm tonight on History, part of this month's World War II season. The war you know, the stories you don't. Watch history on Sky, Virgin, BT and TalkTalk. Talk. <laughs> you could make the main dealer's day by paying over the odds. 
Or you could go to Big Motoring World and save a fortune on up to 2,000 pre-owned BMWs, Mercedes, Audis and VWs in stock. Then with the money you save, put a smile on your face with a cheeky weekend away for two. Give yourself a break at Big Motoring World. Just minutes from the M25. See bigmotoringworld.co.uk. Even if you only employ one person, you have to provide a workplace pension. It's the law. Get to know your responsibilities with help from the pensions regulator. Visit workplacepensions.gov.uk. We buy today. Take control of your property sale with We Buy Today. Whether you're retiring, inheriting, divorcing, or just need to move on, We Buy Today will give a fair price on any residential property. We're the fully regulated home buyer who will work to your timeline with no agency or legal fees to pay. For a guaranteed offer on your property, text today to 82055. Take back control. Text today to 82055. We buy today. Where do you charge an electric car? How quickly can I do it? How far can you go on one charge? How much can I save? Can I charge it at home? Do I need a house with a drive? Can you get an electric shock off them? If I plug in my mobile phone, will the car's battery run out? Can they go in car washes? Got questions about owning an electric car? Get the answers at GoUltraLow.com Divorce. It affects every part of your life. You, your family, your home, your finances. And if you're a man facing divorce, perhaps even one you don't want, the situation becomes even more complicated. It's at times like these that you need a professional you can trust. Cordell & Cordell is dedicated to helping men in matters relating to divorce. Call now on 0330 60 60 161 or visit cordellcordell.co.uk, office in central London. A partner men can count on. I love iPhone. When I get a new one, I can't stop finding new amazing things it can do. But suddenly, bam, all my data's gone and the rest of the month is, well, empty. Please, can you help? Certainly. At Vodafone, the iPhone 8 comes with an extra 10 gig on us, so you can love it even more. It's available now in-store and online with a 24-month extended warranty at no extra cost. You won't find that on any other network. The future is exciting. Ready? Vodafone. Credit check and minimum term agreement apply. Extra data on selected red plans only. Purchased by 31st of October. See vodafone.co.uk forward slash terms. The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Call 0345 6060 we're waiting. We're waiting to find out what happened at this dinner in Brussels tonight. Theresa May, David Davis were there with Messrs Juncker and Barnier. As yet, we haven't been told what had happened, but Juncker promised us this time there would be an official post-mortem. Meanwhile, yesterday, we talked about Hillary Clinton. Uh, we talked about the fact that she said that I'm an unacceptable person, um, and she kind of blamed me for what happened to her and losing the U.S., presidency. This was her in London yesterday. I'm very familiar with what the Leave side said because they transported a lot of that on behalf of uh, Trump. You had, you know, what's the Farage campaigning for Trump and the like. So I'm unacceptable, I'm a liar, but worst of all, I campaign for Trump and she can't forgive me. Well, I'm pleased to say that the president has responded to that about 15 minutes ago in the Rose Garden of the White House. The whole Russian thing was an excuse for the Democrats losing the election, and it turns out to be just one excuse. I mean, today Hillary blamed Nigel Farage. That one came out of nowhere. So that was just an excuse for the Democrats losing an election that, frankly, they have a big advantage in the Electoral College. They should always be able to win in the Electoral College, but they were unable to do it. Thank you, Donald. Well, I got a bit of support there, didn't I? I mean, she's making herself look ridiculous going around Britain and Europe saying, it's not fair, I should have won, but these really horrid, nasty people like Nigel Farage got in the way. How dare I? How awful. Anthony and Staines, what do you make of Theresa May? Is she now at last doing the right thing, or does it look like desperation? Well, I certainly hope she is doing the right thing, Nigel, because yep. what she needs to do is to deploy the ultimate weapon. Yep. And that's the patcher weapon, and that's the handbag. She needs to swing that handbag. <laughs> she needs to channel that inner Thatcher. And I'm sure she can do it. Just to remi r remind people, um, Anthony, of, of, of younger age listening, and there are lots of them, um, it, both in the UK and around the world, she 
in 1984, Mrs. Thatcher went to Fontainebleau in France. The argument was over the level of British contributions. We were paying way, way too much as a membership fee to the union, and she did, metaphorically, swing the handbag and got a pretty big rebate for the United Kingdom. Do you think, Anthony, and you've used the Thatcher analogy, do you mm. think, do you think Mrs. May is made of the same stuff as the Iron Lady? Potentially, yes, because we saw that Theresa May at the Police Federation when she did literally swing the handbag at them and they yep. stood there open, they sat there open mouthed. It's a fair and we point. We saw that Theresa May with Abu, is it Qatar or Abu Kam, so she booted them out. Oh, no, 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 no. I won't have that. That took 10 years. She claimed, she claimed victory in the end, but that whole process took 10 years. But your point about the Police Federation of being tough is a point well made. So, Anthony, what, what do you hope? She said to Juncker tonight. Well, I hope she. Uh, we can't repeat it. She needs to say something quite strong, and uh, in possibly I don't know what language he speaks, uh, German or whatever it is he speaks. Uh, she needs to get really tough, and I'm sure she can do that because let's uh, remember she did win a small victory only last November with Poppygate against a sprawling, you know, bureaucracy, FIFA. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. thanks to that, uh, right. our footballers are going to be able to wear those armbands with the poppies on them. All right, OK, no, let's see, let's hope you're right, let's hope she's tough. Tim doesn't agree on Facebook. He said, I bet she's writing a cheque out for the divorce settlement over dinner. Ian says, time for you Brexiteers to realise that you are not going to get what you want. Simple as that. Well, maybe we won't get what we want from the current political class. Maybe there are more battles and chapters to be fought in this great, great historic battle to get back control of our own country that's the view of a brexiteer uh, and that is the and that is the ticket on which theresa may was elected although many of us worry whether she believes in it will is calling me from evesham will is this a sign the british prime minister is now at last getting a grip well, we, 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 we hope so. May, may, we hope she's actually going to be in to act like a Prime Minister, uh, look at the facts, realise that Brexit is a disaster. Um, All right. I'm sure you uh, saw in the, in the Telegraph t today, was it just under £500 billion being, being wiped off the wealth of the, of, the, of the UK? I'm surprised you're not leading that story. Amazing, actually. E extraordinary story. And difficult to know what's true and what's not. But it looks like... The Office of National Statistics have completely miscalculated the levels of UK investments around the rest of the world. No, or will, no, or will, no, or, no, or, no, or, no, or, or are these massive speculative moves of money on the foreign exchange markets? Uh, what, is this Project Fear again, is it? You think it could be Project Fear? Well, no, project, I, I mean, I, project I, I, fear, project fear didn't come from our side of the argument, did it? I, I have looked at those figures today. I have to say, I'm somewhat bewildered. Uh, I'm not sure what to believe from from official statisticians. Uh, I'm really not. But either way, so what you're really saying, anyway, back 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 to the main point. What you're saying is the prime minister should ignore the will of the people in the referendum and her own election manifesto. We elect an official to represent, and we and we elect salient people. <laughs> they are delegates, are they? They aren't delegates. Yeah, as an MP, you are a delegate. You're, they you're are no, no, no. You're quite right. You're, you're quite right. They are representatives. But well, the, gen the general the, the general election was only a few months ago, wasn't it? So yes, 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 it was, and she didn't have an overwhelming majority, did she? But yes, she, 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 but she, she could hardly say she came storming back voting for for Brexit. Hardly. Hardly. But, I think that's a, that's a very tenuous argument, even for you. But will 85%, 85% of votes cast in that general election were for parties that wanted to leave the European Union, leave the single market, and end free movement of people? Surely, <laughs> surely, yeah. surely, to, surely to backtrack on that would, 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 would be to uh, make millions of people give up any belief of our democratic process in the UK? Well, uh, there is a democratic process, OK, and we, uh, and we elect our representatives, not delegates, representatives, and I want a Prime Minister to look at the facts, can realise that we're like lemmings going over the cliff, we 
realise the rubbish, frankly, that's been spouted by people like yourself. So why... So, so Will, 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 I want to get back to this point, that 85% of people voted for parties that wanted to leave the European Union, the single market, and end free movement. Are you seriously suggesting that all those people who voted in good faith should effectively be betrayed? Are you seriously suggesting 85% people who voted for either Labour or Conservative were all voting to leave the European Union? I'm, se I'm seriously <laughs> suggesting, I'm <laughs> seriously suggesting that if you look at the manifestos that those parties ran on, that is what they were saying. Now... No, no, hang on, Keir Starmer hasn't said that, has he? The Labour Party, the Labour Party manifesto, and we discussed the launch of that on this show way back when. He couldn't, Corbyn, have been clearer. I just think, Will, you know, whether, wh wh whatever your view of Brexit, the economics of it, the politics of it, uh, the one thing that isn't going to happen is she is not going to come back on Friday and say she's changed her mind, however much you may want her to. Phil is calling me from Westminster. Phil, she's out there. Is she battling for Britain or is she desperately now trying to save her job? Do you know, I really don't know. I couldn't answer that question. <laughs> All right, OK, fair enough. The point, the, the thing is this, um, your, your last caller, he, he really, he's really got to take a very deep breath. And, and instead of thinking that we're driving over a cliff, imagine that we're a tugboat cu cutting away from the sinking ship. At the end of the day, you are in a lot of trouble. But actually, the reason I called you is something different. Yeah, um, can you Can you tell me why... We cannot, or what would be the consequences if we start? Um, I'm very disappointed your friends in America are, are so disillusioned with our progress. But what would be to stop us actually starting in principle to make free trade agreements or trade agreements of some description, get our customs union in order, mm -hmm. get our own systems going, and basically say to the fanatics, Phil, the Phil guys, we are not allowed under European Union rules to sign any trade agreements whilst we're a member of the Union. Mr Verhofstadt takes that further and says we're not even allowed to negotiate. So if we were to negotiate, or perhaps to sign something, before the end of this divorce process, then, Phil, we'd be in breach of the European treaties. And that would be very serious. Do you know what? They might throw us out. Oh, we're leaving anyway. Phil, I'm with you. That's exactly. If, if she doesn't get anything out of this summit next week and she wants to stay on as Prime Minister, we have to give them a deadline and get on with our destiny with the rest of the world. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, live from Los Angeles. It's 7.45. <laughs> Coming up at 8 on LBC, Clive Bull. Campaigners are calling for high street outlets to stop using plastic packaging because of its effect on the environment. Should we ban or tax single-use plastic? Clive Bull on LBC. Is your company innovative, successful or rapidly growing? If so, it's likely that you'll be carrying out all sorts of research and development, even if you don't think of it as such. Contact Barnes Rofe to find out if you qualify for an R&D tax credit claim. We'll help you make a claim and obtain a refund of the correct amount of tax for you. Sound interesting? Visit BarnesRofe.com. Barnes Rofe, clever accountants for business. In need of adventure? Then escape with us and travel through an exotic Arabian market to a sultan's palace and a breathtaking cave of wonders before you discover a whole new world soaring through the stars on a flying carpet. Come on in, let the magic begin with Disney's spectacular West End musical, Aladdin. Start your journey at aladdinthemusical.co.uk. Another one tries to dust her. Another one drives a duster. Hey, why don't we get one too? Another one drives a duster. Get in on the action with the Dacia Duster SUV. And with the Dacia Scrappage Scheme, you can save up to £1,000 when you swap your old car for a brand new Dacia Duster. Order by the end of this year and register by 31st of January 2018. Dacia, you do the maths. Exclusions apply. Eligibility criteria apply. Participating dealers only. Visit dacia.co.uk slash scrappage to find out more. Your company is doing pretty well. Your tax position's okay. 
So, what's keeping you awake at night? To face the future with confidence, talk to Vision Consulting. We've expanded from Gantz Hill to the Gherkin, with clients from the fishmonger to the multi-million pound property investment company. And our growth as a firm of chartered accountants and registered auditors is based on our passion for our clients' business. Have confidence in your accountant. See visionconsulting.co.uk. Mm, eating some crisps, watching Sky One. Crisps are proper telly food. No plates, no cutlery, no table. They even come in their own tidy little bag. Just lick your fingers before touching the remote. Mmm, love my crisps. Almost as much as I love telly. Crispy one, sky one. At Carpet Right, there's up to 50% off for choice of floors and beds, plus free credit and nothing to pay for six months. Offers end Tuesday, 8pm. Representative 0% APR minimum spend applies. <laughs> Darling, what's wrong? I missed a call. It was that big order. And when I called back, he'd already gone with another supplier. <laughs> Why? Why didn't we have e-receptionist answering and directing our calls? Avoid the horror of the missed call from just 30p a day with e-receptionist. Visit ereceptionist.co.uk for your free 30-day trial. <laughs> free trial must be cancelled within 30 days to avoid fees. The Nigel Farage Show. Text 84850. Mrs. May rings Angela Merkel. She rings Macron, the President of France. She turns up in Brussels to have dinner. Uh, we think at very short notice with Jean-Claude Juncker and Michel Barnier. Is all of this a sign that the British Prime Minister is at last getting a grip on the Brexit process? Or does it show that the stalemate is bad, that things are desperate and maybe... Just maybe she's lost confidence in David Davis as well. Jean on Facebook says, May can't be strong because she's a Remainer. Rick says on Facebook, if you support the UK, then you should open your eyes and see the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that Brexit offers, rather than being so pessimistic and scared. Well, I certainly have always believed that it is a massive opportunity for the UK. We just need to believe in what we're doing. That's my view. I wonder what Christopher in Dunwich makes of all of this. Good evening, Christopher. Good evening, Nigel. Nice to speak to you. Nice to speak to you. So is our Prime Minister at last getting a grip? Well, I think she now has an opportunity. You referenced the change in our GDP statistics just now. Um, and given that the Europeans are insisting on us telling them exactly how much we're prepared to pay, yep. then perhaps Mrs May is now going to be able to point out that since the amount that we owe the EU is based on the size <laughs> of our economy, given the fact our economy is actually apparently much smaller in size than we thought, that she should be asking for a rebate from the yes. EU uh, on the basis of the fact that we've been overpaying for the last few years. And on that basis, I think she needs to put this back onto the front foot and say, you ask us for money because that's all you really care about. You need money from us. Okay, let's put this down on your terms. This is now the size of our economy. Therefore, our payments should be significantly less. And going forward, we want to make sure that you come back to us and say, if it's all about negotiating the deal, tell us what you're prepared to accept, rather than just waiting for us to keep Christopher, pushing forward and pushing forward. your point is an entirely fair one. Our contributions are based on a series of factors, one of which is the size of the UK economy. These bizarre figures that have come out today um, suggest to me, uh, if, if, if what we've heard today is right, that the Office of National Statistics have had our, have had our economy wrong for many, many years, and not wrong by a couple of bob, but wrong by half a trillion. But, as I say, I haven't majored on it. I'm not sure what to believe, frankly, other than it's simply been incompetence over years. But, but, I mean, and, but, I mean, even if, even if the money thing was resolved at dinner tonight, do you think that the Barniers and the Junkers actually want, ultimately, to give Mrs May a fair deal? Absolutely not. There's no sense, no. from my, my point of view, that this is about creating a fair deal. I think that Juncker and Barnier are representing actually the views of uh, Angela Merkel and the Germans who really want to maintain the idea that it's got to be seen to be almost an unacceptable idea to leave the EU by the UK. Otherwise, there's plenty of other candidates lining up. And I don't think actually it's the EU. I do think it's, it's, it's Germany behind the scenes maintaining this position and talking to Mrs Merkel is not going to 
gain support, it's simply going to harden the resolve that the Germans have because they realize until their domestic economy and their domestic industries really step forward and point out to um, the German Chancellor that punishing for political reasons is not necessarily acceptable economically for Germany anymore, that uh, they're going to maintain this stance. So I think she's got to hold her nerve. I think she's got to recognize that this is a game that's got another 15, 18 months to go. And you know very well that there hasn't been any deal done by the EU ever that's happened before the 59th minute of the 11th hour. No, it's always, day. yeah, it, it's always a through the night, last minute negotiation. That's normally the case. And Christopher, so you're basically telling me that you, you now see this as a German dominated European Union. I think it's been a German dominated Union for a very long time. And I think that the presence of the UK within the EU over the years has given a, uh, a, a different angle for a large number of uh, the junior members to feel that Germany could be at least uh, balanced by the presence of the UK because as a contributor we did have at least some focus some clout. we were able to, some uh, clout. to provide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so, no. you know, it continues to be German dominated and I think that, I think uh, you're probably right. I think you're probably right, Chris. I thank you. And quick mention that the Austrian elections took place yesterday. Austria are about to get the youngest prime minister in the whole of Europe, is Kurtz, in his early 30s. Interesting, though, 56% of Austrians voted for parties uh, that are very much for controlling borders, very against the EU's uh, free movement doctrine. So I think things are changing. And whatever Hillary Clinton says, whatever... Tony Blair says, or Nick Clegg says, 2016, Brexit, Trump, the other things that happened were not, in my view, short-term aberrations, short-term outbursts of anger. There is a movement, there is a trend, there is a massive change that has taken place in the Western world, even if career politicians at the moment don't quite recognise it. My next caller is Catherine, who's calling from Great Yarmouth. Good evening, Catherine. Good evening, Nigel. Hello. Um... Hello. So I, I, I wanted to make yes. Yep. I mean, I, I mean, Catherine, tell me, are you pleased that our prime minister appears now to be doing things? Well, would you send her to buy a used car for you? Uh -huh. Would you send her to a market stall in Great Yarmouth, or would you send her to play poker for you? No, of course not. She's. You would never send this woman to do any of those things. She can't play this game. She's outclassed, out league, and she. You need to send somebody else in, like yourself, who could say, "Right, we're going to walk away. We're going to join NAFTA. We're going to join with the Americans. We're going to pull out of NATO. We're not paying for Germany's defence anymore." End of. And they will scream. Do you? I mean, do you think that if she comes back to this country? late morning, lunchtime on Friday, and this deadlock has not been broken, or we appear to have given yet more concessions, do you think there comes a point when even the Tory party start rebelling and saying, it's time she went? No, without doubt. I mean, they they're already would like to do it. They, of course, would like to do it. They're afraid of Corbyn. And that's why they wouldn't do it. But in any normal circumstances, they would have got rid of her months ago. Yeah, I agree with you that. And like, you wouldn't send her to negotiate anything. It isn't about the details. That is the issue. You wouldn't be able to buy... If you sent her, you'd probably get the car for £1,000 and she'd end up paying 3000 <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. And thank you for praising my negotiating skills when it comes to second-hand motor cars. I didn't know I had that talent. Catherine, I thank you. And my last call of this evening on this is Daryl in Uxbridge. Daryl, good evening. Are you pleased that Mrs May is out there? Do you think she's going to make some progress? Well, good evening, Nigel. Great to talk to you again. Um, the reason I called, you, you made a statement about Mrs May put, running her speech, which she sped at, spoke at Florence, past Junker. Yeah, yeah. Before, before she spoke it. Yeah. Has she gone out there to get instructions um, today? Or <laughs> are you suggesting, are you suggesting that the British Prime Minister is kowtowing to the bosses in Brussels? Yes, I do, because I think she's a... If she's doing that, she's a European pup puppet, and they're pulling the strings. You know? Well, I... I'm, 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 I, I mean, if, if she ran that, that first speech past Jonkers before she made it, why would she do that? 
Uh, yeah. Well, well, she would say it was being courteous and being polite. And oh, Mr. Juncker, by the way, I'm giving a speech in Florence tomorrow, and what I'm going to say is that the European Union is fabulous. Everything about it is brilliant. Uh, although we're leaving. We're going to rejoin every aspect of it, just with a different badged name. Uh, Daryl, I think she's been Theresa the Appeaser. I think she's been really, really weak and poor, and I think she's on her last notice. Do you? I agree. I totally agree with you. And I also agree with your, not your last caller, but your previous last call about being the, comm the year you've been Germany dominated. Yeah. Well... Yeah, whether that was by design, I doubt, but certainly, since the Euro crisis, Merkel and Germany have become the very dominant country. Uh, and, of course, the irony of that is that those that set the European Union up did it to prevent Germany from being the dominant country. Uh, Daryl, I thank you very much for your call. I thank everybody for their calls, texts, tweets, Facebook messages. Uh, I would say on this. I'm pleased that Theresa May is at least doing something, but I sense she's probably asking for a transition deal more than really laying down the rules. Time is running out. And can I just say also, thank you, Donald, to the 45th President of the United States of America for sticking up for me against Hillary, who thinks I'm beastly, but then I probably think the same about her. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively at LBC, live from Los Angeles. I'm back tomorrow at 7. Coming up at 10 tonight, it's Ian Collins. But up next...